Hi there, I'm Ricky Thompson from the University of Washington in Tacoma. Today I'm going to be talking to you about dating in the digital age, searching, swiping, and selling. With the emergence of the internet in the 90s, followed by social media and phone-based apps in the 2000s, the dating landscape has changed dramatically, with online dating as one of the most common and fastest growing means for people to meet, according to Shepard 2016. A 2020 study shows that globally, 31% of single internet users date online, with 85% under the age of 34. In the US specifically, 32 million users accessed online dating services in 2020, with the number expected to reach 35 million by 2024. This chart from a 2017 Stanford study shows that digital technology has recently become the most common way that couples meet. Research by Rosenfeld and Thomas, 2012, has shown that people searching for partners in thin markets are especially likely to meet partners online. A recent Pew Research poll showed that 55% of LGBTQ adults reported using digital dating platforms, compared to half as many heterosexual adults at only 28%. For those who identify outside of traditional notions of gender, sexuality, and or relationship style, Digital dating technologies have provided avenues to find connection discreetly and safely, especially for those who may not be out. To learn more about the role of stories and decision-making in the world of online dating, I designed the Connecting Digitally study. I spent two and a half years analyzing dating platforms and user profiles, as well as conducting extensive interviews with 115 adults. I also followed up with people throughout the pandemic. Participants ranged from 18 to 70 years old and reported a diverse level of experiences with platforms and time engaged in digital dating activities. I employed ethnographic methods for collecting data, and then I applied multimodal critical discourse analysis and narrative analysis to interpret it. In addition, my experience using digital dating platforms also provided deep knowledge about discursive norms and practices within digital dating contexts. An important part of dating is the getting to know you phase, which is largely mediated through storytelling. In sociolinguistics, small stories research has emerged to shed light on the complexity of stories, social media, and social action. Small stories research views stories as contextualized talk and action that legitimates lay experiences of how people make sense of the self over time through biographical narrative activities. That's according to Georgia Kapalu, 2015. Small story scholars argue that stories told in social media contexts with their fuzzy boundaries are important discursive and social resources that create identities for their tellers and audiences. This is according to Page, 2012. They call for more research that explores these sorts of atypical, non-canonical, and multimodal narrative forms as my research does. As scholars attempt to manage the complexity of stories on social media, picking and choosing which elements to focus on remains challenging, especially as new features and affordances are constantly transforming the possibilities of digital narrativity. Georgia Coppolo in 2016 has recently argued to place selfies within the small story paradigm, claiming they provide a personal historiography of the present in ways that acknowledge a broad definition of narrative. Similarly, Eager and Dan 2016 have shown how selfies on social media often show, show the self through image while telling through accompanying text, arguing that the selfie is a tool that aids individuals in present, uh, presenting their self as a visual, complex, and multifaceted public identity through the conscious editorial processes inherent in shot selection, narrative structure, and the decision to share on social media. They point out that different platforms create different types of social interactions and communicative behaviors, and they recommend contrasting studies of social networks, such as dating apps. How convenient for me. <laughs> My research illustrates how dating profiles operate as a type of selfie while contributing to burgeoning research on small stories. I argue that dating profiles, which rely on textual, visual, audio, and digital semiotic resources, constitute another form of small stories that are a vital part of the digital courtship process. Through the development of online dating profiles, individuals make sense of the self and present it to others with the hope of connecting. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with online dating, 
individuals need to create a profile to participate on a platform. Thus, profiles serve as, a, serve as a form of identification that allows entry into the online dating context. I equate the dating profile to the ID card one must show at the bar in order to meet people in offline dating contexts. Profiles can include a variety of identity prompts. At the most basic level, most include photos, a written bio, and identity lab, uh, labels selected from preset categories. According to Ellison and colleagues in 2012, the profile is usefully, conceived, is usefully conceived of as a promise made by the profile creators to their audience, rather than an exact representation of one's online or offline presence. Constructing a desirable digital self on a profile relies upon familiarity with autobiographical narrative writing and then adapting it to each platform's constraints and affordances. My research shows that those without adequate digital literacies, as well as those in small dating pools, often struggle to find connection. Eager and Dan 2016 suggest that, quote, there are competencies required to craft alternative selfie narratives which require know-how to create human, the, a human brand that both stands out and fits within taste regimes of attractiveness. Web 2.0 technologies have led to an increasing number of affordances on dating platforms that mediate identity through user activity and linking to other social media platforms. For example, the affordance of geolocation tracking on dating apps designed to allow users to search within a selected pre -select, or search within a pre-selected radius constructs identity in relation to geographic spaces and neighborhoods. Similarly, the affordance of online status tracking can construct daters in relation to how active or inactive they are. Participants in my study refer to the disciplinary nature of this feature telling stories about how they carefully manage when and how often they're online so as not to appear, quote, too desperate and by consequence, undesirable. You can see on this Tinder profile on the right, there are, uh, it says one kilometer away, active 22 minutes ago. This was a Tinder profile. Lastly, the, link, uh, the linking of dating apps to other forms of social media also plays a role in how the dating selfie mediates identity. For the apps that allow users to sign in through a Facebook account, age information and photos can be automatically populated, constructing an identity that's aligned with a particular social media aesthetic. With the linking of Instagram accounts to dating profiles, access to this social media feed can add a timely accounting of life in the everyday, rather than just um, a curated collection of photos. Linking to Spotify and identifying favorite playlists adds an audio dimension to identity by making the current soundtrack of One Life accessible. We will look at those examples in the later part of the presentation. With dating profiles, the co-construction of this small story form is partly informed by the media affordances of social buttons and swiping with clicks, taps, and gestures communicating whether a story is engaging or in need of editing. With the creation of the like and share buttons on Facebook, online users have become accustomed to communicating their emotions through the click of a button. Dating apps followed suit by integrating social buttons to signal acceptance and rejection of other users. In 2012, Tinder became the first swiping app, switching from the functionality of touching icon buttons to the gesture of swiping across a screen with one finger like such. In this way, the speech act of liking someone or more commonly disliking someone became part of a gamified communicative experience mediated through gesture. Hmm. Little perch there. Okay. According to Heino and uh, colleagues in 2010, and I apologize if I'm pronoun pronouncing that name incorrectly. Online daters often compare online dating to an economic transition or transaction with dating sites likened to a supermarket or a catalog. More, uh, moreover, uh, they argue that the marketplace is visually constructed through the layout and functionality of online dating websites, 
which evoke a commerce or an e uh, which evoke e-commerce sites like amazon.com with all the filters and the buttons. And you can see on this particular page, um, I've given you some examples on the left. We have kind of the, uh, the labels, which often can be linked with icons um, and drop downs. And what are you looking for? What are your political leanings? These are um, common questions that are part of drop down menus that become part of the filtering tools that um, also inform algorithms. So in this metaphorical context of the marketplace, people engage in relation shopping, using filters and algorithms to shop for the perfect partner, while attempting to sell themselves in hopes of finding connection. In my data, online dating stories regularly employ economic metaphors of the marketplace, as well as the job search, with daters investing time, constructing uh, investing time constructing profiles that serve as what they call dating resumes, as well as contributing to a culture in which individuals see themselves as commod commodities to be packaged and promoted in a competitive public arena, economic metaphors such as these frame the search for intimacy in terms of labor while eliding the interpersonal. Interview data in my study suggests that metaphors of the dating marketplace and relation shopping tend to go hand in hand with self-branding. Marwick 2013 in her book, Status Update, defines self-branding as both a mindset in which the self is thought of as a saleable commodity, as well as a set of strategic identity creation practices to be widely promoted and sold through social media technologies. She suggests that self-branding discourses are inherently incongruent in that they call for a contradictory aesthetic of authenticity and professionalism simultaneously. This tension is salient in stories of online dating practices and preferences that tend to privilege profiles that present an authentic yet polished identity. Profiles that make daters want to swipe right, which means good, yes, tend to include a range of good photos, as they're often called, uh, including a close-up selfie, a long shot that displays the body, and photos depicting the profile creator in daily life activities. Daters want to see others um, have dedicated some time to writing and editing their bios, especially if they have. But they also value a sense of voice that demonstrates playfulness or wit. Daters say they are drawn to profiles that give a true sense of what a person um, what a person is like when they are dressed up as well as when they're dressed down. This is what I call the situated selfie. The preference for dating selfies that reflect a realistic ideal demonstrates the power of self-branding discourses in contemporary society. We think of the selfie most um, when we think of the selfie, most of us imagine a close-up self-portrait taken with a mobile phone at arm's length, like this, just above eye level, to hide the double chin, of course, and posted on social media. However, in Sapovina and Zhao 2017 research, they lay out a taxonomy of selfies, and in which case the defining characteristic is the photographer's perspective rather than the photographer's face as the object to be gazed upon. In this way, selfies speak to viewers through presented, mirrored, inferred, and implied selfies, telling them to look at me and look with me. In the first set of dating uh, profile selfies on the left, we see the self on display, either presented or mirrored, asking the viewer to look at me. My data shows that most daters will only swipe right, meaning yes, on profiles that include an unobstructed presented selfie whereas a shirtless mirrored selfie is widely ridiculed and rejected, especially by straight women. Uh, to clarify, uh, some people will not swipe right on a profile if there is no pictures, but having a presented selfie is often cited as a key uh, ingredient to a good profile. In the second set of profile selfies, the viewer is asked to look with me as the images show what the photographer sees, inferring and implying the photographer's presence without showing their face. 
Body parts may be included in the frame, like the feet dolled up in stiletto heels that we see in this inferred shot. These types of selfies tend to be appreciated when they show a dater in the wild and are contextualized through profile elements, like the written bio, photo captions, or corresponding app prompts, similar to the written text that the selfie creator is always looking for an adventure, which is preceding the mountain photo. In my previous research on visual rhetoric and web design in 2012, I extended on Fairclough's 1989 work about synthetic personalization, which describes how professional organizations use language strategies to manufacture intimacy with customers to sell products. I argued that synthetic personalization in digital contexts often relies on visual semiotic uh, resources and platform design to communicate sociality resulting in what I called virtual visual synthetic personalization. As online daters internalize economic discourses and engage in self-branding to differentiate themselves from others, profiles increasingly reflect marketing discourses and employ visual semiotic resources to sell the selfie. As shown in this example from my Tinder profile on the left, a presented selfie of the profile creator gazing at or gesturing towards the viewer speaks to the interlocutor visually and invites engagement. This sort of visual synthetic personalization allows the profile creator to close social distance through the gaze and speak to all app users simultaneously while giving the impression they're being addressed individually. On the screenshot of a hinge profile in the center, the integration of video allows daters to move beyond static images to engage others. According to O'Halloran in 20, uh, 2004, videos are dynamic multimodal texts which display different and constantly varying configurations of sound, image, gesture, text, and language as the text unfolds in time. Few participants in my study have opted to use video options because they say they feel awkward on camera. However, this year of living digitally during the pandemic may change as people have become regulars at mediating uh, their social and professional lives through video chat platforms. Lastly, when technological affordances on platforms provide opportunities to manufacture intimacy between daters, virtual synthetic personalization is at play. Through gestures, users touch, tap, or swipe on the screen to amplify interest in other users, which closes social distance in a couple ways. Technologically, when a dater uses a super-like feature, uh, the platform increases the visibility of that interlocutor by sending a notification to the other person before they make a swiping decision. On the interpersonal level, the act of showing greater interest than a mere right swipe, which is only recognized if the other person also swipes right, is a digital speech act that demonstrates vulnerability, which can contribute to trust and deepen social ties. In Paige's uh, 2020 article on Snapchat stories, she also extends fair clap Fairclough's notion on synthetic personalization, but she illustrates how text, image, and sound work together to manufacture a sense of intimacy between the selfie taker and the receiver. Synthetic collectivism is achieved when semiotic resources are contrived to position the individuals within the audience as if they were part of a larger group. When snaps share an experience with others through sight and sound, selfies can be seen as facilitators of sociality in which viewers are invited to not only uh, look and listen at me, but also look and listen with me. Synthetic collectivism can be seen on dating selfies as dating platforms have integrated affordances to link Instagram and Spotify accounts. In this case, text, image, and sound work together to facilitate opportunities for sociality as daters invite others to be a part of a collective experience, inviting them to look and listen with me. Lastly, in conclusion, I've shown how dating profiles can be read as selfies that serve as small stories in digital dating contexts. When dating is framed through economic metaphorical associations, individuals approach the dating search from a commodity-focused perspective, shopping for the perfect mate and self-branding in an attempt to construct a desirable product to be packaged and promoted. Finally, in the attention economy, social media platforms like dating apps provide insights about how multimodal communicative strategies and technological affordance can simultaneously manufacture and foster sociality. These electronically mediated multimodal stories about the self, which I call me stories, provide important insights about how people make sense of identity and promote the self through social media. 
Thank you very much for your time. If you have questions, feel free to email me at rickytickey at uw.edu. Thank you.